Okay, we are ready. Okay. Let me uh, welcome uh, everyone uh, to uh, this flagship dialogue uh, from the Center for Social and Economic Progress, CSEP. Um, the uh, dialogue is between uh, Professor Amita Batra of the Nehru, Jawaharlal Nehru University and uh, Professor uh, Penny Goldberg from Yale University. Uh, Amita Batra has recently uh, written a book on uh, India's trade policy for the 21st century. Um, and uh, so that's the topic of the seminar, of the, of the webinar, uh, of the dialogue. And uh, we, we will uh, we, we are very lucky to get both uh, Amita Gold, uh, Amita, I was going to say Amita Goldberg, Amita Batra and Penny Goldberg uh, together. So let me first introduce them and then uh, say a little bit about the topic. Uh, Amita Batra is the professor of economics and former, chairper former chairperson uh, of the Center for South Asian Studies, uh, School of International Studies and in the Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi. Um, she has taught also as visiting professor, uh, visiting fellow at the University of Sydney and the University of Edinburgh. Uh, at present, she's also a member of the advisory group for the G20 finance track agenda. And as all of you would know, uh, India is the uh, chair of the G20 for this year. Uh, so there's a great deal of activity going on uh, in that sphere that is in the G20 as a whole, and of course, in the finance track itself. Uh, Penny Goldberg is a former colleague of mine from uh, the Jackson School for Global Affairs uh, at Yale University. She also sees uh, the Eddie Hugh Professor of Economics and, and Global Affairs and affiliate of the Economic Growth Center at Yale University. And of course, it is at Jackson School. Uh, she was Chief Economist of the World Bank Group between 2018 and 2020. And uh, she's also served as the President of the Econometric Society, Vice President of the American Economic Association and Editor-in-Chief Editor of the American Economic Review. Um, she's also been elected member of the National Academy of Sciences uh, and also the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which those of you would know are really uh, major honors to be uh, elected to those academies. Now, um, trade policy uh, is indeed, uh, to my mind, uh, going to be extremely important, uh, certainly for the next decade in India and beyond. Um, there are many difficult issues now coming up with the global slowdown, uh, uh, both in terms of growth and in trade. Um, is also uh, particularly important for India because um, whereas we had uh, recorded very high growth uh, in the 2000s, uh, to around 2002 to 12, actually, when our uh, export growth rate was in fact uh, higher uh, than that of China, even though, of course, not in terms of volume, um, it has uh, stagnated since somewhat although there are now signs of uh, India's exports picking up again. And I'm here mainly talking about merchandise exports. Uh, our service exports also continue to do well, and they've in fact uh, grown very well in the past year. But nonetheless, uh, given that one of India's major problems is employment, and therefore uh, we need to have a much higher growth in, uh, in, in merchandise exports uh, in the, over the next uh, decade, I may also add parenthetically that to my knowledge, no country has grown consistently at the kind of rates that we would like, that is seven, eight, nine percent annually, which is getting more and more difficult given the global slowdown. But to my, to, my, uh, to my knowledge, no country has grown at these kind of growth rates for 10 or 20 years without a very high export growth rate as well. So uh, that is why I believe that this is among the most important topics for us and for policy. So uh, very, very pleased to uh, host this uh, uh, flagship dialogue. Um, the way this is going to be, uh, the, the way that, that we're going to run this dialogue is that first uh, Amita will uh, uh, spend some time, about 15 minutes or so, on giving the uh, key points from the book, uh, the key policy implications of the book, and then Penny uh, will give her comments. And after that, uh, we'll have about little over half an hour, 35 minutes, 40 minutes or so, uh, of question and answer, and I will pose the questions, and any of them, of course, and any or both of them can pick up on the questions. So, Amita, you're off. And let me just ask you first to display your book so that people know what we're talking about. Here's the book. 
Here's the book, that's what India's trade policy for the 21st century, and is published by Rutledge, if I remember correctly. That's right. Yeah. Um, we have the Rutledge art here. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Okay, good. Off you go, uh, Amita. Thank, thank you. you very um, much again. And thank you, CSEP, for um, organizing this discussion and giving me the opportunity to uh, talk about my book, the discussion around uh, the subject of trade policy in the 21st century, uh, India's trade policy in the 21st century. Um, thank you also, Professor Goldberg, for making the time in your very busy schedule today to uh, discuss this with me. Uh, I will, as Dr. Mohan said, be making only a select set of points, uh, which I think are the most important uh, and critical to trade policy in the present context, giving a background, of course, but I think these are the points, not necessarily all of the points, all of the main points as far as the book is concerned, uh, but critical points to the present context that we are in, in terms of shaping India's trade policy. Uh, the book, of course, talks about, as was uh, stated earlier, on uh, focused on merchandise trade, goods trade, basically, and it's about India's trade policy in the first two decades of this century. Uh, the big overarching message, you know, and theme that runs through the book, you know, and that comes across in the book, and that I emphasize in this book, is the extent to which India's trade policy has remained alienated with respect to two major developments as far as global trade context is concerned. The global trade developments in terms of trends A and B in terms of the trade policy instruments as they evolved in the last two decades, particularly in the last two decades and specifically as they were utilized by other emerging markets to increase their share in global trade and in particular in the most trade dynamic sectors. The first, when we talk about global trade developments, you see, uh, we've seen in the first decade, starting, of course, in the late 1990s, a multifold increase as far as global trade is concerned, especially in the first decade. Relatively, there is a slowdown in the second decade, post-2011-12. Uh, this global trade that increased in the first decade significantly, you see, was led by manufactured goods and within manufactured goods by intermediate goods, also more commonly known as parts and components trade. Significantly underlying this increase in intermediate goods trade was the global value chains or what we have as production fragmentation by large corporations across the world. And this was reflected in the dynamism as far as trade is concerned, the most significant sectors in terms of both gains as far as share in trade is concerned, as well as amenable to value chain production are concerned is these are, or these were basically in terms of electronics, automobiles, and in the light manufacturing sector, uh, textiles and clothing. Interestingly enough, when we talk about these, uh, or when we make a reference to this increase as far as trade is concerned, or when we analyze these trends, we see that the increase in trade during this time was led by developing countries. As far as developing countries are concerned, within this, it was led by Asian countries. Asia was in the lead, particularly East Asia was in the lead, with China, of course, being the lead trading partner or emerging as the lead trading partner for almost all economies in the first decade itself by 2008. Where in this picture, I mean, of course, there was uh, just to kind of emphasize that when we talk about Asian countries and we talk about China being in the lead, uh, we should not forget that the Asi other ASEAN countries and other emerging market economies around the world also had uh, registered gains in these dynamic sectors, you know, some in ASEAN, but across the world, emerging market economies were registering gains. Uh, where is India as far as this trend is concerned? We see that as far as India's global trade participation is concerned, although as it was stated earlier, India's global trade integration did increase. Uh, we did cross the 1% mark as far as our share in the global trade is concerned in 2008. It increased after that, but for the last decade and a half, it has been almost stagnant around 2% or so. India's share in global trade has remained at around 2%, which is very small. In addition to this, as far as the main propellant mechanism of global trade or what was basically the cause of the multifold increase in trade is concerned, that is GVCs or global value chains, India's participation has been small in this too. In particular, it increased initially, that is in the first decade, we did see an increase in India's global uh, value chain participation across all manufacturers. But this declined after 2012 and significantly as a variant uh, trend, you know, with respect to the other economies, other emerging market economies, particularly in ASEAN and Asia, 
we see that in 2015-16, which is the last date of the database that was available to me at that point of time, at the time of writing the book, uh, India's value chain participation in all manufacturers and in specific sectors, that is the three dynamic sectors that I've listed earlier, was lower than what we started with in the earlier years of the first decade. You know, We were less than in 2015-16. Uh, in relative to where we were in 2005. If we contrast this with other emerging market economies, ASEAN economies, as well as what we've seen as a significant or the ASEAN economy that made the most spectacular gains, uh, both in its trade shares, as well as in its GVC participation, that is Vietnam, this trend is completely at variance with them, you know. While the ASEAN economies did experience a decline in their global value chain participation in the second decade, and so did the other economies around the world, that is emerging market economies, it was not lower than where they had started from in the first decade, like as in the case of India. In case of Vietnam, it was even more specific or it was even more surprising, or it has been more surprising in the sense that Vietnam has experienced its backward integration with global value chains at a rate that's higher than any other economy. Its gains have been higher than any other economy, and it has remained at a higher level relative to all other economies in ASEAN, relative to India, of course, and relative to its own position at the beginning of the decade. So Vietnam has had a spectacular increase in its trade shares, particularly as far as the electronic sector is concerned. Similar gains as far as global value chain participation is concerned have also been made by other emerging market economies, as I said, Mexico, Eastern and Central European economies. When we analyze these economies, you see, and the trade policies of these countries, what is it that stands out as far as these emerging market economies are concerned? A significant aspect that I see is in terms of the cooperative arrangements and agreements that these countries entered into initially at the sector level, sector specific cooperative trade agreements that they all entered into, and the advantage that they could gain through these agreements and arrangements in terms of integrating with approximate global value chain hub, you know. Whether we talk about Thailand, you know, in terms of ASEAN led by, you know, what was led by Japan at that point of time, later by China, in terms of its very early integration or very early development in terms of the uh, cooperative arrangements, brand to brand complementarity arrangements, for example, which was specific to the automobile sector, uh, later developing into or utilization of the CEPT, the Common Effective Preferential Tariffs of the ASEAN, benefited in terms of integrating with the automobile uh, value chains as far as Japan is concerned and later on with China, extended on to other ASEAN economies as well. Uh, Mexico as part of NAFTA, now USMCA, Central and Eastern European economies, accession to the European Union. So it's basically, you know, you see it across emerging market economies that specific to all of these has been, or common to all of these has been, their participation in such agreements, which evolved into free trade agreements, you know, as we move on in time in the 2000s. And then as we evolve, as we move on further into the second decade or the later part of the first decade into the second decade, we also see an evolution as far as these trade agreements themselves are concerned. Uh, while initially, when we talk about the first decade or the late 1990s into the first decade, as far as characteristics of these cooperative arrangements are concerned, they were basically restricted to tariff reduction or import of inputs uh, exempted from duties, you know, that's that's the essential line of reform or essential line of change that happened, or that was a critical element as far as these cooperative arrangements were concerned. Towards the end, when we have, you know, in the second decade, or when we move from the first to the second decade, we have a change in the character of the FTAs in the sense that they started evolving by incorporating to a very large extent provisions and policies that were beyond just tariff reduction. Tariffs had already been reduced both by GAP WTO as well as by these preferential arrangements earlier on. And now we had the, uh, you know, the FTAs or trade agreements performing the role that increasingly a weakened WTO was not able to. So the provisions as far as uh, FTAs were concerned in the first 
into the second decade or evolving FTAs were basically both what we call as extensive margin as well as intensive margin, greater in number than what the WTO could provide for uh, in order to facilitate trade, particularly trade in parts and components, multiple border crossing of intermediate goods, so as to facilitate ultimate value addition or value addition at different stages and assembly production at a particular point or another country, you see. And as far as these FTA evolving is concerned, the inclusion of provisions were both, as I said, extensive in terms of increasing the number of provisions, but also significantly the depth of provisions in these FTAs was far greater than the provisions as they were part of the WTO. So it was both in terms of greater number of provisions, uh, facilitating the movement of intermediate commodities, as well as integration into value chains, also the depth of these agreement, uh, these provisions. In particular, the rules of origin started to evolve around uh, making them simpler, that is value addition rules at different points of time that were made simpler so as to make cumulative value addition and hence multiple border crossing of the intermediate goods easier for uh, large corporations and ultimately ultimate assembly. When we look at this picture, you know, in terms of emerging market economies and make a comparison with India, I mean, we see what is it that India has done in with respect to these trade policy instruments that were particularly facilitative of entry into global value chains, integration with value chains, and in participating in the most important component as far as global trade is concerned, that is intermediate goods trade. Uh, this, as far as FTAs are concerned, it's not that India did not sign FTAs. We have you know, if you look at the list of FTAs, we have a large number of FTAs. Uh, most will cite 13 as the number. But what is important as far as India is concerned is not the number, but as I said, the depth of the FTA agreements, you know. Uh, what we see in case of India is a limited number of tariff lines that are liberalized. Invariably, we do not come across. In fact, I don't think we have any FTA as far as India is concerned, which subscribes to the WTO defined criteria for FTAs in terms of 85% plus liberalization, that is substantially all tariff lines being liberalized. One, two, this has been so, you know, because we've had very high tariffs as far as domestic, uh, our domestic tariffs are concerned or our tariffs are concerned basically have remained high. Surprisingly, what we see when we compare the tariffs as far as India are concerned with tariffs in the other economies is a steady increase in India's, uh, in India's average applied MFN tariff in the non-agricultural sector over the last decade, particularly in the last seven or eight years. Uh, we've seen tariffs to increase, particularly so in comparison when we make a comparison with the other emerging market economies, and also when we make a comparison in terms of the duty-free lines on offer as far as the other emerging market economies are concerned. The duty-free lines in case of the other emerging market economies has necessarily been a consequence of their participation in these cooperative arrangements early on. You know. That's what they started with, you know, and then they've evolved into more regulatory policy comprising FTAs, you know. In addition to this, you know, when we talk about these kinds of regulatory policies, as far as India is concerned, its rules of origin are highly complex, you know. I mean, why I have stated that in the cases of in the case of other emerging market economies and FTAs as a whole, rules of origin was simplified in order to facilitate multiple border crossing of intermediate goods and value addition. In India's case, we've had more complex uh, rules of origin. And we've had a more difficult criteria defining these rules of origin with value addition at each point being much higher. In addition to that, in the most recent uh, Customs Act in 2020, we've also made it procedurally more cumbersome for importers to avail the preferential duty-free or preferential uh, tariffs, you know, as far as FTAs are concerned. So A, we have higher tariffs. B, we do not liberalize substantially under our, uh, as a consequence, in our FTAs, you know, and C, we make it difficult as far as utilization of FTAs is concerned because the rules of origin certification, certificate of origin for rules of origin is a cumbersome procedure as far as India is concerned, made more difficult in the recent times, you know. Second, you know, what we've seen, you know, as far as FTAs evolving in the rest of the world are concerned, is increasingly taking into account the services investment and, uh, you know, the goods, services and investment linkages as far as trade and value chains are concerned and prescribing or including provisions that can facilitate these linkages or facilitate all three of these, you know. 
In India's case, we've been stuck as far as services is concerned, focused only on one comparative advantage, which, which we feel is our only comparative advantage, that is more for movement of professionals. I think it's time for India, or it's it should have been long back that India should have realized the change that has occurred as far as manufactured goods are concerned and the necessary embedding of services into manufactured goods. And we had started to identify and we should have identified other services that could have given us or where we do have comparative advantage and where we could have negotiated better. Uh, also in the context of services, I think as far as India is concerned, it was necessary for India to have done it as a comprehensive package of goods and services rather than parallel or sequential processes in terms of negotiations. Uh, bargaining becomes more difficult when it's done as a sequential process, which has been done both in the case of India ASEAN FTA, as well as what we uh, also experienced in our negotiations as far as RCEP is concerned. So the negotiations need not have been in terms of sequential in silos, but should have been combined together to have been argued together. Because I think manufacturing or goods and services combined together is what gives us a better advantage than just services, particularly in terms of what we've been arguing for. Furthermore, as far as investment is concerned, you see our model uh, bilateral investment treaty of 2016. Uh, the earlier investment treaties that India had were, uh, you know, were uh, cancelled, you know, as far in 2015 when we brought in this new uh, model uh, bilateral investment treaty that places the onus of claiming the advantages as far as investment is concerned or even identifying themselves as foreign investment, foreign investors, uh, you know, on the foreign investor as such. Plus, it does not have a clause as far as investor state dispute settlement mechanisms are concerned. You know. uh, these have been the difficult issues you see in terms of equity and fairness as far as our model DIT in, that was issued or that was introduced in 2016 is concerned. A huge correction that's required here. Uh, Again, in comparison, a fourth point, I mean, our next point that I would like to highlight as far as India's FTAs are concerned is in terms of support mechanism. You see, in all other countries that we see in East Asia, uh, you've had a state bring in support mechanism for MSMEs in particular, so as to make them or enable them to understand the provisions as far as FTAs are concerned, to help create reskilling and retraining boards so as to be able to train and retrain labor that is displaced from the sectors that are loser sec losing sectors and uh, you know make them more employable in the winning sectors you know that kind of a support mechanism either in terms of facilitating participation in ftas utilization of ftas understanding the legality of the text understanding rules of origin being able to utilize rules of origin or certificates of origin Issuance, none of that is something that India has been able to create as a separate forum uh, where individual enterprise or individual small and medium enterprises can really approach uh, to be able to make the best utilization as far as FTAs are concerned. Finally, what we have, you know, as far as FTAs are concerned, is in terms of our oft repeated argument that India has a deficit with most, uh, you know, has incurred deficit because of its earlier FTAs and hence we do not wish to go ahead with FTAs that have already been undertaken with let's say ASEAN. The trend was in terms of post FTA, India's deficit with ASEAN increasing. Uh, I've heard many policymakers in recent times to say, you know, that as far as these trends are concerned, it kind of discourages India to move forward with its, with its free trade agreements. However, as I said, you know, if you have higher tariffs to begin with, uh, incurring a deficit with lowering tariffs when we move in for preferential trade agreements is a foregone conclusion. So a prior to enter into any trade agreement would require India to lower its tariffs as a whole on an average uh, as far as non-agricultural sector is concerned, and particularly so as far as the specific more dynamic sectors where we wish to integrate in value chains are concerned. You know. I Next, I mean, uh, just to highlight, you know, the most recent instance that we've had as far as uh, trade agreements are concerned, which is in the form of RCEP, where India has not been able to negotiate or India walked out or India withdrew in the last round as far as these negotiations were concerned. And hence, India does not participate or is not a participant as far as RCEP is concerned. And often given argument in this case, 
which I go into detail as far as the book is concerned, is that we have agreements with all countries, participant countries, as far as RCEP is concerned, be it ASEAN, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand. Australia, New Zealand, we do not yet have an agreement, FDA, a full-fledged FDA. We only have an early harvest scheme. In addition, it needs to be, uh, it needs to be understood that a larger mega regional trade agreement allows you know, rules of origin that bring in the common rules of origin and common rules of origin that allow for cumulative value addition across member economies. And that is an advantage that goes only to the member economies of the RCEP, not to those who will have individual or bilateral FTAs with member economies. That's one part of it. The other argument that's also discussed in detail in the book, you know, is that, you know, where we, where we do want to have bilateral agreements over and above or beyond the mega regional, beyond the plurilateral, it's very important that the bilateral FTA be deeper than what the mega regional or what the plurilateral allows us. Invariably, or sometimes the plurilateral does get caught in allowing for flexibilities that is the lowest common denominator given the differential levels of development across uh, membership of a larger agreement. You know, Neither of these hold as far as India's FTA with either ASEAN or the other member economies of the RCEP are concerned. Therefore, I think it's a lost opportunity as far as RCEP is concerned. My last point, if I may, that is, you know, in terms of the dynamic context that we are in today, uh, as far as the global context is concerned, you know, I mean, when you look at the India's, as I said, India's participation in global value chains has been low. Uh, India has not really been able to take the advantage as far as shifting global value, shifting value chains from China are concerned, both in the wake of the global financial crisis in the period after that. Uh, the emerging evidence, uh, you know, that we have or the, the evidence that we have as far as post um, or in the wake of US-China trade tensions are concerned, uh, India has been a very marginal beneficiary of the shifts that have happened in these two waves of value chain shifts. You know. In fact, if you look at the first uh, phase you know, in the post-global financial crisis period, uh, India was considered to be one of the potential gainers and the lead gainers potentially as far as value chain shifts were concerned. But this did not happen. Again, reasons being multiple, but you know, in, in terms of main agreements, facilitative instruments as far as trade agreements are concerned, and higher tariffs continuing to be a major obstacle as far as shifting value chains are concerned, something that we continue to see today. Similarly, as far as the US-China trade tensions are concerned, even after that, India was not able to really avail of the gains in terms of the China plus one strategy that started to gain momentum at that time. Now we are in. Uh, it's it's another opportunity that India has uh, for a way, you know, for making the best of what is happening in terms of a more activated plus one uh, strategy that the large corporations are adopting across the world, uh, both post pandemic as well as in the wake of the Ukraine crisis. I think it's become a very significant opportunity that India has. Priors remain as far as tariffs are concerned, trade agreements are concerned. But I think what one also has to remember at this time is that this is also a time when there is a flux, uh, you know, or there is a certain dynamism in terms of both factors that are leading to a bundling of, that is a rebundling of value chains consolidation uh, back to regionalization. And there are also similar factors that are probably going to lead to another not necessarily wave, but also going to lead to unbundling. AI, robotics, you know, enable distant monitoring of value chains. So that's another possibility that's also emerging. So we have a combination of factors at this point of time, both on account of geopolitical factors, uh, the pandemic that has happened, uh, technological shifts that are happening, you know, in terms of factors that lead to greater bundling at one end, but also greater unbundling at one end. So the possibilities of value chain increase and integration with value chain remains as far as India is concerned, and gains continue to be had as far, continue, we can continue to have gains as far as integration with global value chains is concerned. That's something that we need to continue to strive for. Uh, just the last point that I'd like to make here in terms of 
what India needs to do. I think I've already highlighted FTAs, tariffs, et cetera, but I think a big thing here has to be in terms of India not interpreting uh, the objective of self-reliance as completely inward or more protectionist policies uh, here on. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Amita. Uh, that is really a tour de force on your book, uh, which uh, is always very difficult to cover a whole book in as short a time as you did. But it was uh, really pretty comprehensive, and um, lots of lots of food, uh, lots of food for thought uh, in the context of our current uh, trade policy. Uh, Penny, can I ask you to now go ahead with your comments? Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Rakesh, and thank you, Amida, for inviting me to discuss the book. This is a topic that's close to my heart, and uh, the book does an excellent job of um, uh, giving an overview of the main issues. Um, as Rakesh said, summarizing the book in 15 minutes is an impossible task. There is a lot of substance in the book. <laughs> and uh, 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 one thing that I particularly liked is that it, it uh, strikes a fine balance between summarizing global trends and uh, going into great detail um, in explaining what how India has failed to participate in global value chains. As anyone who has worked on trade policy knows, the, the, the devil is in the details when it comes to trade negotiations and the and, and the book provides many details about how these trade agreements um, uh, are structured and how uh, India has failed to negotiate uh, uh, its uh, path to higher trade participation. Uh, so um, uh, I will abstain from giving very specific comments on the details of the book, both because this would be impossible in the time we have and because I think Amita uh, may have much more expertise in this area than I do. Um, I, I'm not an expert on the Indian economy, but my own interest in India um, uh, dates back to the 90s when India implemented a major trade liberalization. And I tried, I, I studied this trade liberalization with my co-authors. Um, what we found is that the trade liberalization had positive effects on product innovation. So we approached the topic more from the point of view, how did trade liberalization, how did access to cheaper imports, to imports of capital goods and better technology, how did, did it influence innovation rather than the perspective of export growth? Um, and then when trade growth stalled uh, around 2012, 2013, as Rakesh pointed out, I started wondering what had happened in India. So the book answers exactly this question. So what happened and why India has stopped um, promoting trade? The one uh, question I found myself asking repeatedly uh, in the past years, and I kept asking myself while reading the book, was why did India decide to take this, this direction? Um, as Amita pointed out, this is not an isolated case where India failed to reach a good deal in one particular trade agreement or where policymakers uh, made some mistakes. We, it, it's natural to make mistakes. But when one reads the book, um, it, it becomes quite clear that this is a matter of uh, a policy choice, a choice away from trade and towards other policies. And, and my general question for Amit and perhaps the audience, and this is perhaps something that we can talk about uh, more later, is why did India choose to go down this path, especially given that other economies in Asia, as Amita pointed out, decided to take a very different uh, direction. And again, as evidence has suggested, the, the growth miracles that we witnessed in the previous three decades were all associated with very fast export growth. Uh, so this is a puzzle to me, and uh, I would love to discuss this further. This is probably Amita's next book <laughs> uh, on, on, on why this happened. Um, uh, one quick comment on the global trends, and especially the slowdown of trade and of global value chains. And, and again, this is something we may want to come back later. Um, uh, many organizations, many trade economies have been emphasizing the slowdown of trade. 
But actually, if you look at the data, the slowdown is driven primarily by China, to a lesser extent by India. As you pointed out, India is too small in trade to matter in aggregate statistics. So it's mainly China. Um, as China has moved towards a strategy of dual circulation, emphasizing domestic demand rather than exports, their, uh, uh, their uh, participation in global value chains decreased. And uh, that also affected the global statistics. However, if you look at the rest of the world, if you look at other countries, and especially in East Asia, um, until very recently, trade uh, kept growing, and especially uh, trade in global value chains. And this is especially uh, true for um, trade in, um, in parts and components, which is a very good measure of global value chains. So um, uh, uh, until very recently, I would have said this, this slowdown of uh, trade is not necessarily a necessity dictated by technological, technological trends. Now, the policy environment has changed dramatically in the last few months. And so we, we may be facing a very different picture um, in, the next, uh, in the next few years, in the next decades. Now, uh, let me come to the main, to, to, to my main, main comment uh, of the book, uh, which is going to be a general comment. So, so the book is generally uh, a positive analysis. So it lays out all the, um, uh, the failures, if I may say, of India uh, to uh, uh, promote trade and uh, both in terms of global value, uh, uh, global value chain participation, but also in terms of engaging trade instruments that have been important in trade policy in recent years. So it's, it's a positive analysis that lays out all these issues. There is, however, a very strong normative um, undercurrent in the book. And, and, and the normative part is the premise that ultimately the goal is to increase um, exports and especially merchandise exports. And, and Amida talked a little bit about this at the end that just promoting growth in services is not sufficient. We should bundle that with growth in merchandise exports. And um, as you know, I'm a, I'm a trade economist. I'm, I'm a, I'm, 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 I believe trade is very important, uh, but I would like to challenge this premise and especially I would, I, I would like to challenge it in face of the new global challenges that we face right now. Uh, so uh, we had planned to discuss this book last fall. Um, since last fall, there have been dramatic changes in the United States and the United States policy, where we have witnessed a, 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 a very strong departure from multilateralism. Now, this is not new. This had started many years before. It started, I would say, around 2015, 2016, with increasing concerns about trade. It's not specific to the United States. It also applies to certainly to, the, to Britain with Brexit, but also to some skepticism is also evident in other European countries. So in general, in many advanced countries, we see much more skepticism uh, towards global trade. So I'm not convinced that the opportunities that were available to uh, low and middle income countries in previous decades are, are going to be available to countries in the decades to come. Uh, some countries have managed to already position themselves very well, uh, like Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand. Uh, others like India have failed to do so. And one valid question one may ask is, has the ship already sailed? Is it too late for India to catch up? Um, I might have given a different answer uh, if uh, if uh, we had this conversation a few months ago, but given the current changes in the US and in the global environment, I'm increasingly skeptical that trade, especially trade the way that was uh, conducted in the previous decades can be the engine of growth uh, for, 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 you know, for many uh, developing countries. Uh, I think this is an issue. Uh, I very much believe in what Rakesh said, that fast growth has always been associated with um, export, with fast export growth. However, I'm not quite sure that this is going to be feasible in the decades to come. Uh, one more thought on this. Um, when the 
uh, trade tensions between the US and China uh, arose in uh, 2018. So when the US first imposed tariffs, first on, uh, on steel and aluminum, and then on many goods from China, and then China retaliated. Uh, there was great anxiety about these developments in the US and also in Europe. There was a great anxiety about the future of trade. But in many developing countries, uh, there was true euphoria. Uh, you know, that, that applies to many countries in Latin America, but also to Asia. And the expectation was that these countries would fill the gap, that these countries would take advantage of the tensions between the US and China uh, to take the place of China. So many countries saw a great opportunity there. Now, um, I have studied these developments with in, in some work with my co-authors, and what we found is that indeed many countries took advantage of the situation and increased their exports. So we cannot make any general statements about welfare, but they did increase their exports. In fact, they increased their exports so much that global trade in the products targeted by the tariffs increased. Now, if you ask which countries benefited from these changes, you see the usual suspects, Vietnam, Malaysia, but also many European, many East European countries. Uh, Mexico is one of the great beneficiaries. India was certainly not one of them. So India did not benefit, uh, was not hurt by these trade tensions, but also it did not benefit. Uh, and this is very much consistent with everything Amita says in the book that you know India had not positioned itself to take advantage of these opportunities that came up. Um, Moreover, you know, in the work we did, we asked the question, so why did these countries benefit? Is it because they were lucky and they happened to be specializing in products that were targeted by the tariffs? And the answer was, no, it was not really the product specialization that accounts for the success. It was more country-specific characteristics. And in fact, there are various indications that the countries that benefited the most were countries that were already well integrated in the world trading system through deep trade agreements, for example. So as global value chains were uh, getting reshuffled and they were repositioning themselves, there were certain countries that were able to take advantage of this situation. India was not one of them. So again, this lines up perfectly with everything that the book said. And, and so that raises the question, perhaps if India takes the next the necessary steps, it can now take advantage of the new opportunities that may arise because these tensions with China have escalated to, to a full not, not, just, not just trade war to a full economic war. So can India now be the plus one in the China plus one uh, world? And, and there, again, I'm, I'm a little um, uh, skeptical, and not only with regard to India, but with regard to any other country, that it can play the role of plus one. And, and, and let me tell you, let me you know, uh, offer a few thoughts why I think, I think this is the case. All these FTAs and the trade and the bilateral trade agreements and the regional trade agreements that played such an important role in the development of global value chains. And I fully agree with Amita that without these uh, FTAs or these regional trade agreements, global value chains might not have been able to function as well. All this, though, took place at a time when countries had embraced multilateralism and when the World Trade Organization kept expanding by admitting new members, uh, many of them uh, developing countries. So all this was anchored in multilateralism, and that played a very important role. Uh, in many cases, these regional agreements were used to reinforce uh, rules that the WTO had adopted and extend them, and it was easier to extend them because the countries were more similar and perhaps uh, you know, ha ha had more similar interests. Uh, this is very different now. So, so now we have, uh, I think most people would agree, we have a general departure for multilateralism. And we still see the formation of many regional trade agreements, especially in Asia. We also have other uh, plurilateral agreements. Um, uh, across many countries all over the globe. But it seems that the primary objective there is to discriminate against countries that are excluded from these agreements rather than integrate the members. And this is a very different mindset. I'm not sure that any country is in the end going to benefit uh, from this, including India. It, it puts it in a very precarious situation. So it may be able to take advantage of the current environment for the next year, but it may find itself in a very different position uh, 
in a few years. And one of the reasons for that is uh, I do not think that advanced countries will allow uh, a, a, a second shock from a developing country to take place. Many people in the United States talk from the China shock. So the fact that the, the imports from China put a lot of pressure on labor markets in advanced countries. Uh, I do not think that the mindset in advanced countries and especially in the US right now is one that would ever allow a country like India or developing countries to take the role of China in the past with potentially similar consequences on local labor markets. I think we, we are in a very different position right now. Uh, so, so this is my main concern. It's not just what India does. It's also what the US does, what other countries does. It takes two to tango and in trade, it takes many more to dance. And here that seems to be a, a, a generally a, a, a mindset away from globalization for which I wouldn't blame just India. Uh, Finally, you know, a last point I want to make regards the role of services. So uh, I think this, the, the general global environment is very bad news for developing countries because trade is vital to their growth. Uh, that said, I think conditional on being uh, a middle income country or a low income country, India may have it much better than other countries. And the reason is India is, is a, a large country. Uh, by virtue of its population, by virtue of its uh, geographic uh, uh, area, uh, by even by virtue of its economic size. A and so uh, that means that the domestic market can play a much more important role than the foreign market. This is not to downplay the role of trade, but I still think that uh, the domestic market could be the engine of growth in India, and here services could play a very important role. Uh, perhaps one day we'll manage to solve the current tensions and embrace trade again. And if this happens one day, I think the new frontier is going to be trade in services. This is the area that still remains highly restricted. Uh, this is the area that has the potential for enormous growth. In that area, India has an enormous comparative advantage, uh, uh, partly because it's a population that speaks English, it's well familiar with norms and cultures of other countries. It's an extremely diverse country, uh, almost as diverse as the United States, and this is a huge benefit when you trade in services. And finally, uh, it has embraced the digital economy, and this is all also going to become important in the future. So I think this is the new frontier, and uh, I think liberalization in the service sector or fast growth in the service sector is even less tenable right now, given the current policy environment than trade in merchandise, um, in, in, in uh, goods. But one day, this may be the new frontier. Um, there's a lot of potential for encouraging service trade within the domestic country by, by uh, eliminating domestic barriers to trade. Um, and, and this would be one step towards one day uh, being more successful in, in international trade. What's the downside of such a strategy? Well, the downside is it's not going to lead to the fast growth Rakesh talked about. It may contribute to the growth of Indian economy, but one would not expect the growth miracle that China has experienced in the last few decades. To close on a pessimistic note, uh, I'm not sure this growth miracle is feasible anymore. I mean, one bleak interpretation of what the United States did in the last year is we, we embrace trade, we embrace free trade with developing countries as long as the developing countries remain poor. And if they manage to eliminate extreme poverty as China did and rise very fast, then we, we hit the brake and then we make sure they don't grow any faster. If I were an Indian policymaker, I would, I would, I would, that kind of lesson would give me pause. And so I don't think that uh, we can count on, 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 on the lucrative US or European market of the past to play the same role we played in the past. So I'll stop here and I hope we can discuss some of these issues more. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Hour. Thank you very, very much indeed, uh, Penny, for that very thoughtful um, and, and comprehensive uh, response and of course giving a much more of a global view and um, taking uh, much more uh, account 
of the current trends in uh, global trade, uh, the role of the U.S., the changing policy stance of the U.S., and of course, the U.S.-China tensions and the uh, retreat of multilateralism. So, but let me start uh, the, my questions with, in fact, taking off from just where you left. Uh, in terms of the, uh, you're quite right, I think, that the kind of boom in uh, European and American demand for goods that came essentially from Asia, not just China, but all of ASEAN, and of course, Korea, and much earlier, Japan, will not happen in the future. Now, I imagine that uh, apart from change in stance, it's also uh, the, the given the demographic uh, expectations for the developed countries uh, that there will be uh, slowdown in demand and also for, for, for therefore for trade, for imports. And so my question really is, however, that most projections as of now, but of course, there would be changing and the most recent global economic prospect report from the World Bank uh, is sort of consistent with what you're saying. But what I was about to say is that Asian countries, that is China plus ASEAN plus Korea in particular, uh, plus South Asia as a whole, may be expected to grow at four or 5% a year over the next 10, 20 years, possibly. Now, uh, their weight is now completely different than what it was 20 years ago. And the combined weight uh, will start approaching US and Europe put together. So my question to both of you is, uh, is this the kind of uh, uh, scenario you're giving? Is, isn't it too pessimistic and perhaps thinking too much of US and Europe as the drivers rather than uh, Asia, which has about 4 billion people who will presumably be buying all the usual stuff you know, for 20 years? Um, so why shouldn't we think that uh, trade and goods will keep increasing? Of course, at a slower pace than it did earlier. But and in that context, um, um, is it correct to say that India has missed the bus for uh, labor using manufacturing exports? Who would like to go first, Amita? Um, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Penny, for um, your very, very comprehensive comments and bringing the discussion to the current, to the present uh, scenario that we are in, you know. Um, I agree with you on some points, but I also differ with you on the extreme uh, doom and gloom that you predict as far as global trade is concerned, you know. Uh, and to some extent, I agree with what Rakesh is saying, you know, in terms of looking at Asia, you know, as the um, as the region that's that should be expected to deliver and that what and that's the region that we should be looking at, you know. Uh, it's something that I have written and which is going to come out tomorrow in my column, you know. Uh, but what I, you know, what I'd like to do here is, you know, uh, two, three points, you know, that I'd like to take up, you know. One, when you talk about retreat from multilateralism, you know, uh, that's something that started, you know, in 2017-18. We started to see, in fact, the entire, uh, you know, FTA is becoming deeper and taking up provisions that were never ever part of what the WTO subscribed or prescribed, you know, by itself was revealing in terms of the strength of the WTO depleting over time. You know, we've seen this happening over the last decade. So multilateralism has been on the retreat, I think, for a long time now. FTAs have survived. FTAs have allowed trade to survive, I think, during this time, irrespective of what happened to multilateralism. What we are seeing now, you know, in terms of the US and EU, I think is a response to geopolitics, you know, in the sense of, as you say, they are not going to allow developing countries to take a position of, you know, a major power that it's the power competition, I would say, you know, which is more political and is being played out in the economic arena, you know, and we are looking at developments like the, you know, Inflation Reduction Act, protectionism, as far as, uh, you know, that's, that's, under the umbrella of the IRA, you have protectionism in the US, you also have protectionism or EU becoming more and more protectionist, you know, we have all of that. But I think we need to point out at this time, the what is happening in Asia and what has happened in Asia, let's say during the pandemic, the revival of trade in the, the last quarter of the first year of the pandemic, you know, was on account of 
the Asian economies, you know, they were the lead economies as far as trade at that time was concerned. And today what we're looking at as far as Asia is concerned is two mega regional trade agreements that they're gonna be taking forward. I think we're also looking at more and more European economies that are inclined to participate in the other mega regional, you know, which is the comprehensive and progressive uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPTPP, you know, and both of these, by the way, whether we talk about the RCEP, you know, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is ASEAN plus the other economies, you know, in the East Asian region, Australia and New Zealand combined, or we talk about the CPTPP are in fact in alignment with the WTO. I mean, they have defined when we talk about IRA or when we talk about the other issues as far as EU is concerned, I think there the violation of the prescribed uh, WTO provisions is happening, but that's not happening as far as uh, Asian region is concerned, you know. So with multilateral, multilaterally, uh, multilateral system prescribing the kind of uh, uh, trade agreements that we are happening, that we are looking at as far as uh, Asia is concerned, I think Asia is going to retain the dynamism, the belief in trade, uh, and continuing to and will continue to be the centerpiece as far as global trade is concerned. I think uh, that's something that we should be looking at, and that's something that India should be looking at as far as its alignments are concerned, rather than looking at West, which is becoming more and more selfish and protectionist. I would say, you know, in this war with China, you know. And it's also important, I think, for India to align with Asia at this time, because if we don't, one, RCEP is where China is, you know. The other, China's application to CPTPP. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I mean, if we keep uh, China in the waiting room forever, that's a different thing, you know. But otherwise, it's going to be China making the rules decide, you know. This is going to emerge as a major trading block in that sense, you know, because these countries... Uh, if we look at the ASEAN economies are also the ones that benefited or are benefiting from the plus one shift that is happening from China to the maximum extent possible. A lot of the firms that were in China find it advantageous to be in the ASEAN countries today, you know, and are shifting uh, to these, you know. And, you know, the the uh, the other bit, you know, in terms of the larger global pessimism that you talk about in terms of trade uh, not being in the same format, yeah or value chain, parts and components, intermediates, et cetera, yeah. you know. I have a slight, uh, slightly different viewpoint there, you know, because yes, the West wants to create these supply chains on its own, for example, the IRA and the uh, electrical vehicle stuff that they are, you know, envisioning for themselves today, you know, in North America. But the capabilities in terms of being able to do all of that on their own, uh, through the kind of resources that they are thinking about in terms of Canadian reserves, as far as critical minerals are concerned, I think starting from scratch is going to be very, very difficult and a time consuming uh, activity, you know. So it's not going to happen overnight. I don't see it happening in the short or the medium term, you know. Long run, yes, maybe, you know. Uh, as far as Asia is concerned, the value chains that are in China continue to be in China. We are still talking about a China plus one. Nobody is talking about a complete displacement as far as China is concerned or an OMAS shift from China. Uh, I think there is a certain stickiness, sunk costs that have been incurred as far as, uh, you know, placing the entire network that we have of supply chains in China are concerned, you know. The maximum that can be affordable at this time, I think, given the pandemic, the bankruptcies, given the kind of financial turmoil that we're looking at, you know, is probably going to be shifts at the shortest distance possible within ASEAN, you know. So I think that's the probable scenario that I would envision, you know, happening or unfolding in the region globally, you know. Uh, and even if we look at, you know, if we kind of extend it and take it back to the earlier decade, um, it is East Asia that was leading the way as far as parts and components trade is concerned. Uh, the complexity of the value chains, you know, just before you have, uh, you know, a retreat by the United States and so on, it was really an increasing uh, percentage or proportion of sh uh, trade that was happening between the North American value chain and the European value chain, less so as far as uh, European is concerned, uh, but more so as far as North American is concerned with East Asia. It was, you know, the interregional in that case was more, intra-regional in case of Asia was always more, you know, although it was led by China. And I think it'll be continued to be, uh, it'll continue to be led by China even now, you know. I mean, can I just ask Penny now to... Uh... Yeah, sorry. I mean, in that sense, uh, I think <laughs> differing views and probably, con you know, uh, 
you know, this, this is actually very interesting. Uh, I mean, yeah. that's exactly what a dialogue is for. Yeah. So to get the different views and, of course, uh, find middle ground if possible, but otherwise, it's certainly a good idea to get different views. So both of you raised the issue of Asia that, that I guess you agree with my gloom and doom. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say prediction because I it's a prediction condition on policy. And my prediction is that if we continue down this policy path, this is going to we're going to have a retreat from globalism, but the hope is that this is not going to persist. So, uh, but but you both uh, you're both saying so. This may apply to Europe and the United States, but the dynamism is in Asia, and I agree with that. But there are two different uh, ways one can think of, about Asia. So the first is to emphasize the plus one mindset, which is we keep. Great, pretty much as is, but India takes or some other country takes the place of China. In my view, this is not going to be a very promising path. The other one, I, th I think, Amita, this is where your comment is that Asia focuses on trading with itself. In that setting, China is going to be important, uh, uh, even for demand purposes. You know, as Rakesh, you mentioned, demographics are changing. You know, China is a very large market. Uh, which can be the source of very high demand. So um, I guess what I'm, I'm very skeptical about is if we have a simultaneous decoupling of China in the US and in India and you know, the rest of Asia, this is going to be very, uh, uh, it's going to be very hard to argue that uh, uh, trade can keep growing when China is completely cut out. Now, if we, uh, if we have a setting where there is a lot of trade with Asia, including China, that's a different story. But I think geopolitics are there very important as well. I mean, India stayed away from RCEP. And again, I know, Amita, you're critical of all of this, but um, I, I agree that if India were to embrace trade within uh, Asia, including China, that, that, uh, that uh, could be a very different story. I just think this is perhaps even less likely than the U.S. turning around. <laughs> uh, yeah. In fact, uh, just on the, the on the sort of doom and gloom part, uh, Penny uh, and Amita, um, the measures like climate change related measures like CBAM, um, is that going to affect global trade? First, Penny, and then uh, maybe Amita can ask you on the effect of India. So again, my, my answer would be the devil is in the details. It's in, in yeah. how this C bomb uh, will be implemented. In principle, it could kill trade with uh, low-income countries, and mm. not just C bomb. If you think about the current labor and environmental standards, mm -hmm. uh, and, and we may want them for good reasons. I'm not saying that we shouldn't care about labor and environmental standards, but we should be um, aware of the fact that they would imply much less trade with low-income countries that may have a very hard time meeting the standards. And I think actually, Amita, that you, you're kind of um, cautious um, in your book when it comes to these issues. You, you, you warn that we may not want to completely embrace trade, for example, with the European Union or Britain, because it's not clear it is in the interest of India right now. Um, and again, in the long run, all these things may have very positive effects, even on the Indian economy. One, one reason that we often want trade reform or participation in trade agreements, it's a way to discipline domestic interests and domestic lobbies to the extent that one wants to push for, uh, for labor standards or environmental standards in India, it might be easier to do it through trade agreements. But if the pace is too fast, if these measures are too drastic, then they can kill trade with this uh, uh, with uh, uh, lower income countries, including India. Um, and in general, they could have huge implications for comparative advantage. Right? It's a, a, essentially, you put a huge tax on products that are uh, produced with mm -hmm. polluting, heavy polluting techniques. So if, if it were truly implemented as in the textbook, it would have huge implications. Now, my prediction is it would not, people would find a compromise. It would not be implemented as advertised. Amita, uh, I would like to... Very briefly, I yeah. think um, 
Uh, one, of course, as uh, Penny states, you know, that uh, difficult to implement given the technical and methodological challenges, I think, that there are in being able to calculate the uh, carbon emissions as far as imports are concerned, you know, that's one part of it. I think it's, uh, it's not made out to be so, but inherently it has protectionist elements in it because uh, what CBAM ultimately um, leads to is the rest of the world or those who want to trade with EU uh, having similar or, um, you know, EU conforming trade, sorry, uh, climate policies, you know, basically carbon emission norms, you know, should be similar to at the same level, they should upgrade themselves. Uh, given the fact that you have uh, least developed economies or, uh, you know, developing countries not coming up to that level or their capabilities to transition to that particular level being limited at the moment. Yes, it's a protectionist. It has a protectionist element in the sense that it will impact trade with these economies. Also, I think the five or six product sector categories that have been identified under CBAM, you know, are clearly, um, you know, targeting, may, may not be, you know, actual targeting, but ultimately it's targeting the products that are exported by uh, developing countries, you know. So it's a very clear, uh, you know, uh, outcome that we, we are likely to see if it is implemented in the form that it has been proposed or passed in 2022, which is going to be decreased trade with developing countries, including that with India. Though I think India's share is very small as far as some of these commodities are concerned to exports to EU are concerned, you know, in that sense. So one uh, issue, Amita, um, that um, uh, you emphasize is the role of FTAs. Now, to the extent that in a sense, the world uh, is, is, is dividing itself into the regional trading bloc. So you have the EU, of course, um, the uh, USMCA, or it used to be NAFTA, um, and of course, RCEP in Asia, and now the CPTPP. Uh, to the extent that uh, India is not part of any of these, um, would you agree, Penny, that, that uh, Amita's argument that uh, it's difficult to be part of, active part of global value chains, unless you have these deep FTAs or RTAs, or be a, to be a member of these deep FTAs, RTAs. And therefore, uh, would it be correct to say that if, we, if you're not part of any of these, um, then indeed it'll be very difficult for, for India to, uh, to expect a large uh, trade expansion, export expansion in goods. So I fully agree that FTAs played a very important role in, in the rise of global value chains. And, you know, if you take the optimistic part of my comment, which is that the future may be in trade in services, yeah. there are deep agreements uh, yeah. are going to become even more important. Um, so, yes, I think this is crucial. Now, let me point out that the same issue is being debated in the United States from the American point of view, because the United States are not participating in these yeah. agreements either. So, so I think the one uh, point that you've made, and, and you have me almost convinced, <laughs> is that the future is not in trying to uh, penetrate the previously lucrative markets of the United States and Europe. Uh, I don't see the future there, but there may be a future in Asia. So all these trade agreements and the deep FTAs we're talking about, we should be focusing on Asia. I, and I think to the extent that you want a, you know, an optimistic view of the future of trade, this is where the future is. I agree with that. Uh, but um, uh, again, I think all these FTAs, some of them are not really uh, uh, confined to Asia, like CPTPP. Yeah. Right. RCEP is, you know, India has not participated there. So I think the mindset would have to change to be one where we embrace FTAs, but we focus mostly on Asia and countries with which we have uh, enough in common so that these big issues regarding uh, CBAM, labor standards, environmental standards, do not become obstacles to the formation of the FTAs. I was just giving your point of view, Amita, would you want to comment on that? No, I mean, I, this is, I believe, you know, that we have to be a part of uh, some of the other mega regional trade agreement. 
Uh, and as I said, the Asian mega regional agreements, you know, are the ones that are really operating, you know, and they are going by the multilateral rules. Uh, also, when we say CPTPP, you know, I think C we are not joining ourselves because there's China. China, of course, has applied to CPTPP as well. We haven't, you know, so I think we have to make a move to participate in either one of these. Uh, CPTPP is a higher grade, uh, you know, trade agreement, more difficult for us to accede to that. RCEP was easier, we didn't do that. But I think a prior to joining any of these FTAs is to reduce our tariffs, you know, until unless we do that, we cannot be talking about what is the starting point for all FTAs, which is substantially all trade to be liberalized. So, and, you know, we've, I have seen, you know, that we've had a steady increase in our average applied MFN tariffs, you know. Uh, so that's a little, I mean, not little, but that's a big contradiction, you know, when we want to trade, you know, but we do not want to bring in imports at uh, lower uh, tariffs, you know, because that's, not, that's what gives us competitiveness ultimately. So just uh, to reinforce this point, uh, apart from the competitiveness, mm -hmm. uh, it's a good idea to reduce tariffs because you increase competition, you know, you can, you, you put some discipline on the domestic economy, you put some discipline on domestic prices. Um, so even uh, as I noted before, just you know, imports have their own advantages. You import technology, cheaper capital goods, that also promotes growth. So independently of promoting export growth, reducing tariffs should be, uh, sh should be the first step. So I think we are, but the, the, the big question I think for, for the global economy right now is, do we envision a trading system uh, without China, where China is completely excluded? This is the question that the US faces right now. And to a certain extent, India faces it as well. And um, on, on, on tariffs, I've often said that why, why do we economists not make the case much more strongly that import tariff is exactly equivalent to export tariff? Uh, and it's then easier to see that, look, it's harmful to you. So academic work has made this point. The problem exactly. is, yeah, at I least in the U.S., yeah, surveys yeah. show that pe yeah. people don't know what a tariff is. Yeah. So we talk about tariffs, but they don't even understand what the tariff is. So, so it, uh, there's a huge gap between what we say as trade economists or as economists more generally and what the public understands about trade policy. So let me ask my sort of almost last question uh, before I go to some of the audience questions. Um, one thing that has happened in the world is increase in industrial policy, including in the United States uh, on particular semiconductors and I assume some other things as well, which I'm now not aware of. But there is the uh, in the is garb of the what in the Inflation Reduction Act uh, and other measures. Um, so what is being argued by many people here in the policy making circles or advising policy making circles is that look, uh, everyone is doing it, so so should we. And this has taken shape in the very large uh, product so called production linked incentive scheme, where uh, the what the government has been doing um, is to make some calculations somehow of how Indian industry is handicapped relative to Vietnam and China. And then they make some calculations of the chosen, I think, 14 sectors so far, with actually giving a subsidy with certain conditions, this production linked incentives that incentive is linked to a certain uh, amounts of incremental new investment in that particular sector and incremental production, which are all specified. So now I don't want to go into the details of that because uh, that is too India specific. But I first, uh, Amitabh, um, can, given what you have sort of uh, said in your book and also what you've said here, that uh, do you have a view on this in the sense that before we can do, what is argued is before we can join um, uh, FTAs or RTAs, um, this is what we have to do. And as we get do this better, then maybe we can join the FTAs and RTAs. I don't think it's like before we join the FTAs, we should be doing this, you know, that's one. Uh, two, um, the rest of the world doing it and we are also doing it, therefore, I think is also, uh, it's not a correct, um, the parallel is not correct, I think, you know. The rest of the world is, 
Yes, there is an increase as far as industrial policy is concerned, subsidies are being given, et cetera, IRA, as you said, you know. But there, you know, they are defining some very select sectors, you know, in the name of, uh, you know, whether it is national security or what, you know. Uh, so critical products there are being defined in a very, uh, you know, I, I think in a very selective manner, you know. Unlike that, as far as India is concerned, I think 14 sectors for now, but I think the, there was a recent statement, you know, saying that we are willing to expand, you know, if need be to other sectors as well, you know. And even in these 14 sectors, we've not just got sectors where we feel, you know, that we need to reduce critically our dependence on some other uh, economy and therefore develop our own uh, production, you know, be self-reliant in that or reduce our dependency on another economy, you know, what we are doing is we are probably extending subsidies to many sectors that are that cannot be justified on, I think, this kind of a sound ground, you know. That's the second point that I'd like to make, comparisons with the others, you know. A third point is that we cannot be giving subsidies at the same time be talking about local content rules, you know, at the same time be increasing tariffs on inputs in those sectors, you know, because that becomes all in all protectionist completely, where you're trying to bring the same, you know, go to the old uh, 1970s, 60s argument, you know, in terms of doing things domestically, building the entire supply chains on your own behind protectionist walls. In fact, you know, when I was kind of looking up things, just to kind of update myself before this um, discussion, I looked up the tariffs in the electrical equipment sector, you know, for India, and I observed that in the, just when I was, I mean, I wrote the book, submitted in 2020, and now between then and now, you know, you've got an increase as far as average applied MFN tariffs in the electrical equipment sector are concerned. Mobile telephones, you know, and electronic equipment is something where we are trying to make our case for PLI's success, you know. So if that is what we do, you know, in terms of increasing the average MFN tariffs in that particular sector, while we give subsidy, while we emphasize or impose local content rules, you know, then I think, you know, we are not doing the right thing. And I also feel that in this case, the objective should be defined very clearly in terms of exports, the proportion of sales that should go in, that should go as exports, you know, because that is where then competitiveness issues come in and that's where the import tariffs then will start to be reflected, you know. No, the problem there is uh, you're trying to follow WTO rules, which is why they haven't done it. But uh, let me go to you, Penny, uh, just on this issue, not so much on India, but how true is it that uh, many countries are now doing industrial policies which they were not doing, say, in the last uh, two or three decades, uh, whether it's China, whether it's Vietnam, whether it's Korea or whoever, and of course, the United States. Well, I, as Amita was speaking, I thought, I, I was thinking I could take her comments and apply them to the US because mm -hmm. many of these points yeah. apply very much, not all of them, but many apply to the current yeah. US policy. Uh, so let, let, let me start by saying I'm not, I'm, I'm perhaps one of the few economists who I'm not, uh, ideologically opposed to subsidies. I think there are cases where you can find a justification for subsidies, for example, when there are externalities. So when we talk about green transitions, green energy transitions, for example, or addressing climate change, there I think subsidies are very much needed. Um, a carbon tax may be great, but the carbon tax is, is very hard to implement in many settings. And so subsidies may be the second best. So I think there are many cases where one can justify subsidies. I also think that they are they have been used more extensively than people think, even in the past three decades, without uh, the label industrial subsidy, but they, they are used. Um, so I'm not fundamentally opposed to them. I think the whole problem with industrial subsidies and that's uh, with industrial policy, and that's perhaps one reason economists are critical. It works very well when it works, <laughs> but it can lead to huge disasters when it doesn't. And it's very hard to tell ex ante when it's going to work or when it doesn't. Um, it's not that we have a checklist where we can figure out what is going to be promising and what is not. And I think one lesson perhaps we can draw from China. So I heard that many times, I've heard this many times from Chinese policymakers and the point seems plausible to me, is that the reason their policies were successful was not because they picked the right sectors. In many cases, they didn't. But it's because of the way they implemented them. They started at small scale and gradually, if the policies proved successful, then they scaled them up. 
So in particular, they, they started at the regional level. Um, and if a policy proved uh, successful, then they would apply to more regions or to the national level. If not, they would scrap it. So they, they engaged in a lot of experimentation and little by little, they figured out what to do. I'm not sure this kind of strategy is feasible in a democracy. So in the United States, the thinking is often, now we are in power, now we can do something, now let's go all in. Uh, and that leads to very big initiatives that may fail. So I, I think it's a very tough question, but it, it's very hard to know in advance what is going to work. Thank you. Now uh, we have about uh, 10 minutes left. So I have some questions from the Zoom audience. Uh, first from, this is very India specific, first from Ajay Chiba, uh, who uh, was the Deputy Director General of the UNDP. And uh, he was also uh, in the World Bank for most of his career. Um, and he is uh, logged in from the Washington DC. But he's, this is a very specific India question. The government announced a new export policy last week. Um, it, it will be good to have the author's views on this policy, its targets, instruments, and viability. Um, is it uh, feasible for India to achieve the target they've announced of two trillion by two trillion dollar exports by 2030? Given that uh, 22-23 was around uh, 750 billion. Amita, this is for I guess this basically for you. Well, I would. Uh, I mean, I I can't say whether 2030 will lead. I mean, this policy will lead us to that much. Uh, you know, but I. Uh, as we've listed in this discussion, you know, that the global trade context has changed so much, you know, and the trade policy of today, I think needs to take all these into account and then formulate policies, you know, uh, none of which I really find as far as this trade policy is concerned. All that we find is a little bit of tinkering and changes that probably align the trade policy or our trade measures with what the WTO requirements are, you know. So it's small measures, it's procedural measures, uh, largely, you know, that have been uh, changed, reconfigured in some of the other manner. Uh, I don't think there is an underlying or a broader overarching vision uh, that a trade policy needs to have at this point of time, given the context that we are in globally. So let me uh, put a harder question to you, Amita, that if uh, we did things that you are suggesting, can we reach 2 trillion by 2030? Sorry, again, I'm not going to give it in numbers, you know, but I think we need to do some of these yeah. definitely, you know, because the short run may have a lot of these global slowdowns, things like that, you know, but I think a medium term, long run vision for our trade policy is in, we need to start thinking about these things and doing some of these, certainly, you know. So what other general question, uh, this is India specific question, but I'm turning it into a general question. This is from Jaydeep Gadhavi. Um, there's currently, because of all the things that are happening in the world, um, there is a, a move towards trying to make rupee a prominent trade currency and do bilateral trade deals so that you can trade in rupees. Uh, so I'm making the general question uh, as opposed to just a rupee, but the bilateral uh, trade deals to, in, in a country's own currency. Um, Penny, first, let me ask you, what, what do you what, have you thought about that? Uh, have you come across those, those kind of arrangements? Well, I think very recently we had this discussion in the context of the Mimbi. Uh, okay. My view is that it takes... Uh, it takes a lot of time for a currency to establish its credibility. So I don't think that we're going to see any changes anytime soon. Uh, you know, certainly not in the coming decade. Mm -hmm. But what about bilateral deals where you're just doing it with a few countries that you say we are going to allow rupee trade or your own currency trade? Not. Uh, not... I, I'm not sure. I, I think it's it, it would complicate deals. Mm -hmm. um, a considerable extent having just one currency to to translate all numbers into it's it's much more uh yeah. straightforward so from that point of view from a logistical point of view it's it would be easier to stick with the current approach amita no i would agree with that you know i mean to establish convertibility of a currency require international convertibility requires a lot of other measures you know which i don't think we have in place uh bilateral deals Limited amount of trade that can happen in rupee terms, yes, possible. But all trade uh, bilaterally also, I'm not so sure. 
Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question from Zaidi Sattar. I'm just mentioning it because we already covered, but we already covered it. I just read it out since he has bothered to send it. Uh, if Europe and US don't look like large markets for the future, how about Asia and Pacific? Uh, because by 2050 or earlier, Asian GDP would exceed 50% of world GDP. I think we've covered that pretty well. And so, uh, but I thought I'd read out the question, which I think he must have put in before we covered the issue. Now, there's one issue actually, with, this is also kind of related in a general fashion uh, to the trade policy, uh, although it doesn't say so. Uh, so they said the, the, the question is from uh, um, Manjari Mahajan, and she says that there are many silos at policy uh, at work here. Uh, for, how, for instance, how is trade policy being discussed separately from other parts of the economy? Part of what allowed China and ASEAN countries to be successful in exports is that prior investments in human development, health and education, over the population. Shouldn't one of the points of discussion for India be not only tariff reductions, et cetera, but also simultaneous investments in public health and, 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 and primary education? So I can, I can briefly say I, I completely agree. Um, Actually, I think Amita uh, uh, hints at this in, in the book when she talks about domestic policy. So, for example, the uh, small scale small scale industrial reservation policies and the, the implication of this policy for trade. But the, the other big issue is uh, investments in human capital. So, especially if we talk about services trade in the future, uh, it it would take a, a major retraining of the population. Uh, so, uh, of course, there are also other other reasons to pursue such investments, but but uh, successful trade participation, yes, it does require skill upgrading. So, uh, at the minimum, I would emphasize that. Amita, um, I would agree with that. You know that in the context of, but I'd add a little uh, one more point to that. Yeah. Uh, one, of course, is the services bit that Penny emphasizes, you know, that's the kind of services that are being talked of in the context of digitalization, etc., where we can excel and where we have a comparative advantage at present. All of that requires not just primary education, but it requires skills of tertiary education and above, you know. So for us, I think that set of services is probably not going to, to serve the purpose as far as our employment question is concerned, where we should, I think, focus on, you know. And even in that context, you know, it's very important that therefore we start thinking about the embedded services as far as manufactured goods are concerned, you know, and start thinking about trade policy as well as negotiating trade agreements, you know, on that basis, looking for comparative advantages in those services that are combined with goods today, you know. Uh, apart from that, yes, of course, I mean, there is no doubt that as far as investment in human capital and uh, both in terms of education and health is concerned, contributes to uh, building capital, you know, for any economy, you know, in terms, it's a strength to any economy and should be done. Thank you, Amita. Um, so Manjiri Mahajan, uh, thank you for that question. And just to put in an institutional plug, which is why one of our main areas of work is indeed human development right now, concentrating much more on health policy. And hope we'll also start working in education policy, because it's absolutely right that uh, even the availability of industrial labor, what many industrialists tell me is that they have difficulty finding, uh, I, mean, I, don't, I, I really find it hard to believe because uh, there are only 15 million or so people employed in organized uh, manufacturing, but still uh, many of the industry people tell me that it's difficult for them to find skilled labor. I don't know if that's true, but that's, they certainly uh, say so. Um, when, uh, on, on this embedding services um, in, in, in the manufacturing, I would look at also slightly differently, what I often used to say in the US actually, was that uh, it's true that, uh, I, that the, that the um, share of imported cars uh, has gone up tremendously in the United States, say compared to 40 years ago. But a lot of the value added is after the car shows up at the port. And the huge number of uh, dealerships all across the country, and of course, then uh, repair shops, et cetera, that this is one of the things that is not often uh, understood. And we know that for, for clothing particularly, that the uh, CIF price of a garment is a fraction of what it's sold at in, a, in any European or US department store. 
So I think that uh, the, 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 one of the things I think countries miss when they're talking about particularly finished goods imports is that there is still a huge amount of value added in the importing country, uh, which is often uh, not talked about. It now remains for me to uh, thank uh, uh, you very much, Amita, for taking the trouble. Uh, for your, as you know, um, I've appreciated your work and and particularly the book very much, uh, because if, unfortunately there are not that many people working on trade currently. I'm hoping that we can expand this group, and um, if there's anyone in the audience who can give us funding for it, we'll do it on a large scale. So. <laughs> Uh, but more seriously, we will do it actually at CSEP and taking account of many of the issues that have been addressed in this, because as has been discussed uh, quite comprehensively in this dialogue, the world is indeed changing very fast uh, in terms of the global economic situation, global economic governance, governance of trade and so on. So we really have to be much more fleet footed in terms of policy on how to how to how to uh, address all of these issues and penny thank you very very much uh, indeed for taking the time um, getting up early in the morning um, to be in this uh, dialogue and uh, if i got up the same time as you must have got i wouldn't be very um, <laughs> i wouldn't be very clear in what i what i would say because i'm a late riser but a late oh, thank, thank, thank you. I actually I actually learned uh, yeah. plenty from this conversation. So, and uh, so I thank hope, you for that. Thank thank you, uh, Penny, and I hope that we can continue our association in some form, and we'll probably will get back to you uh, as we can start some work on trade. Sure. Thank you. And, and we also thank my colleagues, uh, Trishna and Malvika Sharad uh, from our communications team, who have done all the background work that goes on to putting up such a Zoom seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohan. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Penny. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.